principal and I am audible. <coughs> The recording. Uh, let's see. So today, let's see if all the scribes are present or not. This uh, group number seventeen. So ID number ninety nine. Are you there? Yes, sir. Hundred. ID number hundred. Are you there? Hundred and hundred and one. Yes, sir. Okay. Hundred and two. Yes, sir. 103 yes sir and 104 yes sir. okay great okay so let's continue with linear algebra unless someone has a doubt in the previous class any doubts any questions so far okay fine let's continue so just to revisit what we did a long time, long time back. Looked at matrix transpose, which I am assuming is clear to everyone. If you have an M by N matrix, its transpose is a N by M matrix. Columns of the transpose are nothing but rows of the original matrix and vice versa. Just repeat the notation once more. So A1 star, okay. I star in general denotes the ith row of the original matrix A, okay, but written as a column matrix, okay. Uh, I hope this notation is clear. Okay, so in case you see a notation for a vector which does not have a transpose, right, that implies I am always thinking of that vector as a column matrix. Okay, and then in the last tutorial, we also introduced the concept of row space. It's nothing but the set of all linear combination of rows of the matrix. Okay, and the notation is sort of interesting in the sense that we want to represent the set of all linear combination of rows of A. Remember, rows of A are nothing but columns of A transpose. So we are basically looking at the set of all linear combinations of columns of A transpose. And that is nothing but the column space of A transpose. Okay, so that is how the notation of row space can be seen. C of A transpose. Okay, and it can also be written as, remember, whenever you multiply a matrix, by a vector to its right, we are basically taking linear combination of its columns, okay, so which is why this notation. And the other thing is the row space is a subset of Rn. <coughs> okay, its properties obviously the zero vector will belong to the row space, right? Just select y equals 0m. If y is your 0m, then a transpose y will be 0n. That is why 0n belongs to the row space. The other interesting property which we also showed was true for the column space as well as the null space is that if I take two elements in the row space, then any linear combination of these two elements will also belong to the row space. Is that fine? Hope uh, not going too fast here. Silent, so I assume that implies you're only comfortable with this. <clears throat> so now that we have introduced linear combination of rows, we can obviously define something called the row rank of a matrix. Okay, and we have seen this again in last week's tutorial. 
the number of linearly independent rows of a matrix is called its row rank right okay then let's look at the fourth special subset associated with the matrix okay so as we have row space which is analogous to the column space similarly there is this subset called the left null space which is analogous to the null space okay the definition of left null space is a set of solutions in r m to p equation a transpose y equal to the zero vector okay this entire set is what is called the left null space Why? Because you can see this is nothing but the null space of A transpose. Okay. So, if I take the transpose of this equation, what do I get? If I take transpose on both sides, what happens? Anybody tell me that? This is the transpose of A transpose Y. Y transpose yeah. A. Y transpose A equals O N. O N transpose. Okay, so you can see you are trying to find vectors Y which I am going to multiply on the left of the matrix A so as to get zero. Okay, so that's primarily the reason behind the name left null space. Okay, and it is the same as null space of the matrix A transpose. So therefore, rather than introducing a new notation, we use this particular notation. Okay, it's the null space of the matrix A transpose. Okay, and this entire set is a subset of Rm. Okay, this set also in for the fourth time has similar properties. The zero vector obviously belongs to the left null space okay, because the transpose multiplied to the zero vector of course is equal to the zero vector. And the second thing is again if I take two elements belonging to this set the left null space, then any linear combination of these two vectors will also belong to the left null space. Does that sound right? <coughs> yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. So, we have sort of seen all four subsets associated to the matrix. Can somebody just we collect all four of them so that we can summarize this. Sir, can you show the last slide once again? Last slide. This one? Oh, yes, sir. One second. Yeah. Okay, sir. Done. Thank you. Okay. Right. So, what are these four special sets we have seen associated with the matrix A? First one. Column space, space of A. Column space of A. This is a subset of R N. N. Okay. Then null space of A. Null space of A is a subset of R N. R N. Third. Today. Row space. Row space. Yes. A the subset of R N M or N N N N. Yes. Fourth one is just there in this slide left. This is a subset of R. Okay and. They're not just subsets, right? You can 
see that these two properties that are listed in this slide, these two properties hold true for all these four sets. Okay, so they are, in, right now I'm not going to introduce that terminology, but please remember this, these are some, I mean, there's this special characteristics of all these four sets. Okay, we are later going to see what these four, these two properties signify. Okay, and we'll give it a name. Okay, but just remember that these are two properties that are true for all these four set, subsets, and therefore these are in some sense, or in this particular sense, special. Any questions here? Uh, just for the sake of completeness, we showed in the last tutorial that the row space and the null space, right, are in some, I mean, they're not disjoint, but the intersection always contains only the zero vector. Okay, and of course, if I repeat, since this property is true for any A, it has to be true for A transpose as well. Therefore, the intersection of the column space of the matrix A and its left null space is also the zero vector, of course, in the appropriate space. Right? Uh, any doubts with this particular property? this particular question in tutorial 8. No, sir. Okay. And then the second thing we proved in tutorial 8 is that the row rank and, sorry for the typo, column rank are equal. And it does not matter what is the size of the matrix. Okay for any M and any N as far as, of course, they are positive integers, right? The row rank and column rank have to be the same. Okay, that is again something we proved in tutorial eight. And therefore, instead of having two separate ranks, row rank and column rank, which in the end are the same, we define what is called rank of a matrix. And the definition is simply the number of linearly independent rows or columns is going to be called the rank of that matrix. That clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. So now, so this sort of ends a particular topic where we discussed for a given system of linear equations under what circumstances will there exist a solution? When will there be multiple solutions? Where will there be no solutions? When will there be unique solutions? Okay, in doing all of this, we completely ignored how to actually find the solution. Okay, so let's now try to take a look at that. Uh, before I do this, would just like to know how many of you are already aware of Gaussian elimination or row reduction? Is there anybody who is aware of Gaussian elimination? Yes, sir. But, sir, we are to know only in case of a square mm -hmm. matrix. Only in case of square matrices. Uh, is that true for everyone? No. So, Somin said no. no. How about the others? No, sir. No. Okay, fine. So, great. So, let's look at that in detail. All right, so uh, the way I'm going to do is I'm going to use an example. OK, 
Okay, and I've tried to incorporate all possibilities that you can come up with in this example to show how to solve a linear sir, system of equations. Yes. Sir, a row reduction echelon method is. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, sir, what wealth na aaya tha? That is why I asked. I'm, so I did my 12th a long time ago. We didn't have this. You know, maybe the syllabus and curriculum have been updated. So if this has been done thoroughly, then I can sort of skip this and move on. If it has not been done, then we can discuss this. That is why I asked. So that's it. Uh, most of you are saying, no, let us do this. And in case you think, oh, OK, now I remember we did this. Please let me know. Okay, so then I'll speed it up. Okay, so uh, if you look at this example, how many variables does this have? Five variables. Five, five variables and four equations. Four, four equations, right? So it's a rectangular sort of a system, right? Not a square system. Okay. <coughs> And what we are going to do is, so if I give you two equations in two variables or three equations in three variables, uh, all of you might solve it in your own way, right? Right, but what is the common method that you will use? Sir, we take one, any, I mean, we assume any one value of L one variable and then we solve oh, is that how you solve it okay oh, I, sir, I from one equation, sir from one equation we take we take the value of one variable in terms of other variables right right so i hope all of you agree that that is especially one way in which you can solve right by replacing one variable in terms of the other variable in all equations so as to eliminate a variable Right? All of you are familiar with that method? Maybe only in a 2 by 2 system or 3 by 3 system, but I hope all of you have tried that method. Yes, yes. sir. Okay, so the only thing is you as a, let's say, Tarang might want to, so if I give you a 3 uh, variable system in 3 equations, let's call the 3 variables x, y and z. Tarang might eliminate X, Vandan might eliminate Y, uh, Purav might eliminate Z, right? So all of the three methods, although the principle is the same, right? But the procedure seems to be different. What I want to teach you over here is, see, now, two by two systems, three by three systems, we can solve it, right? Any human being can solve it. How about thousand by thousand? Or 1,000 by 10,000, 1 lakh by billion, right? So any strange and huge size that you can imagine, 100,000 variables in 100 lakh uh, equations, etc., etc., right? So, of course, we will have to rely on a computer to help us solve that system, right? Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, right, a computer is sort of dumb, right? I mean, you need to tell it precisely what it has to do. Which implies, of course, since you are studying algorithms in this semester itself, I believe. Is that true? You are studying algorithms and data yes, structures? Sir. Right. So we basically have to come up with an algorithm for solving the linear system of equations. Right? We must tell the computer precisely what steps it should follow. Right? We cannot let it uh, sort of say, okay, take uh, your favorite variable. Right? The computer will not understand that. Okay, So we are going to look at a general algorithm. I am just going to cover the algorithm in a slightly abstract way for this example, okay? So there would be a few more details that you would have to know in order to be able to write the code, okay? But it's almost there. 
Okay, so uh, this linear system of equations in five variables and four equations, we will sort of first try to see. Right now, if I give you this system, right, it is difficult to solve, right? I hope all of you agree with that. Even if there were five equations, so as to make it a square system, which in simpler dimensions you are familiar with, this would still be a difficult system. So as all of you agree, <coughs> what we can do is we can start eliminating variables, right, using these equations itself so as to reduce this system to a system which has fewer number of variables, right? That's in some sense a general strategy. Yes, sir. Right. So we are going to follow the same method. Okay. As few variables as possible. Reduce the number of variables using the relations or equations that are already given to you. Okay, but is it going to be possible that these four equations in five variables, you're going to be able to reduce it into only one variable? Right? All equations simultaneously, can you reduce it into one variable? No, sir. There no, will right? be at least one where we will have two variables. Exactly. So let us try to reduce this linear system or transform this linear system of equations right to something simpler and just to make my life easier rather than writing the names of the variables which anyways are not important it doesn't matter whether i call the variables x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 or a1 a2 a3 a4 a5 right so let's remove that and represent this linear system using a matrix Okay. If you look at the first five columns, the first five columns are nothing but the coefficients associated with each of the five variables in the four equations. Okay, And then you would see there is a vertical line right? that is just there so as to tell you that what the column that lies to the right of this vertical line is nothing but the vector the column vector formed by the right hand side values. Okay, is this representation understood? Yes. Okay. Yes. This sort of a representation of a linear system of equations is what is called the augmented matrix. Clear? Once again, uh, I'm going in a slightly faster pace simply because I think uh, some of it at least you should be familiar with. In case you find I'm going a bit too fast, please stop me. Okay. Okay. So then <coughs> the next obvious question is what can we do so as to reduce the number of variables? Of course, that's not it, right? You would still want to preserve the solution because the problem given to you is to solve the original system of equations and not something new which is easier to solve but is going to have a different solution. So what can we do so as to reduce the number of variables but still preserve the solution? Even we can uh, add Trying to make zero linear uh, combination of rows to another row. Right. So why can you do that? So if you look at this augmented matrix, Vandan is saying you can do a linear combination of rows. Right. Are you sure that this is going to preserve the solution set? And maybe somebody else can answer this question. Yes, sir. Adding two rows will preserve the yes, solution. Why? Because the new equation means the new row. We have just added the corresponding linear combination and uh, yes. Right. So when you are doing a 
linear combination of these rows, you are basically combining two equations, right? Linearly, that two. Yes, sir. And if you recollect how are you solving a 2 by 2 or 3 by 3 system, you're basically doing that, right? You're using two equations to eliminate variables. Right? You're basically doing a linear combination of equations. So the solution set will, of course, be preserved. So combining two or, of course, more equations to get a simpler equation, right, is basically what you do. And that, in terms of the augmented matrix, is simply replacing a particular row of the augmented matrix with a linear combination of two or more rows. The AM here stands for, of course, augmented matrix. Sorry, sir. Can you repeat last? Sure. So the way we simplify these equations, by simplify I mean reduce the number of variables, is by combining by linear combination of two or more equations, right? So yes, sir. So if you look at both these representations, if I do a linear combination of these two equations, the first two equations. In the augmented matrix representation, it basically means you are doing a linear combination of the first two rows. So that's the same thing. So therefore, doing a linear combination of rows of augmented matrix and replacing a particular row by a linear combination is the same thing, right? Yes, sir. And that is, of course, going to preserve your solutions. Okay? Because of this, when you are doing a linear combination of rows and replacing the resultant or taking the resultant and replacing a particular row, Using that, you're just combining two equations and that, of course, preserves the solution. So we define operations that we are going to call elementary row operations. Okay, so elementary row operations includes these things. Exchanging two rows, right? What does exchanging two rows imply for the original equations? Exchanging the equation. Exchanging Negative. the order of equations, right? The order of equations anyways don't matter because you want, you're trying to find a solution for all equations simultaneously. The order of course doesn't matter. Therefore, exchanging two rows is not going to <coughs> disturb the solution set. Similarly, adding a multiple of one row to another row. That is just a linear combination. And multiplying a constant to all entries of a row. That is also just a linear combination. All these three operations are what are called elementary row operations. And why are they important? Because they preserve solutions to the linear equation system. Is that clear to everyone? So this is one second, and this is third. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, the idea is to use these row operations to get an upper triangular augmented matrix. Let me define what we mean by upper triangular here. So, what is the index of this entry? This is 1, 1, right? This is 2, 2. This is 3, 3. 
this is 4 comma 4 so upper triangular augmented matrix means all entries so what is this four entries of this matrix called these are called diagonal, diagonal. diagonal elements good so a matrix is called an upper triangular matrix if all entries below the diagonal are zero That is the definition of upper triangular matrix. How does that help, by the way? Helps introducing the variables. I mean, this process is basically replacing variables, right? Reducing the number of variables. <coughs> so, do you all agree that this system is easier to solve? I guess so. How will you solve it? Sir, uh, after this. Sorry? Sir, after this, uh, we will apply elementary operation again to get a diagonal matrix. Why? Can't you solve it, solve the system after this step? So we we will yes, see sir. at the last row so we can uh, we will have one value of uh, one variable's value then we will uh, put it in a uh, second last row exactly. and then again and again. that is what is called back substitution see if this were to be a square system maybe i will demonstrate Right, so this would be your upper triangular matrix U. If this is the upper triangular matrix, can you solve this system? This is nothing but 3x plus 2y plus z equals 5, uh, minus 2y plus 2z equals 10, and 5z equals minus 5. What is the solution? You start with the equation which has the fewest number of variables and by design that would be the equation corresponding to the last row. Right? You may have other equations with the same number of variables as the last row. But it is guaranteed that there will be no other row which has fewer number of variables. Okay, so how would you solve this? First, take the last row, the so equation corresponding to the last row. What is the solution? Minus 1, z equals. Z equals minus 1. Then, what do you do with it? Substitute what in second equation. Substitute in last, second equation. Second last. So, what would be the equation now? Minus 2y equals? Plus 12. Plus 12. So, what is y? Minus six. Minus six. Then what do you do? Substitute both of them in the first row. So what is the equation? 3x equals? 18. 18. 18. Okay. So what is x? 6. 6. This process is what is called back substitution. And believe me, uh, I don't know how many of you have used softwares like Python, MATLAB, etc. All of these softwares for a general linear system of equations, all those system of equations are solved in this way. Elementary row operations are used so as to obtain an upper triangular matrix. Once you have an upper triangular matrix, back substitution is performed to solve.
तो इज दी जनरल आइडिया ऑफ हाउ टू सॉल्व लीनियर सिस्टम ऑफ इक्वेशन क्लियर ओके ऑगमेंटेड मीट्रिक्स फ्रॉम दी ऑगमेंटेड मीट्रिक्स यूज एन एल्गोरिदम विच ऑफकोर्स वील यूज एलिमेंट्री रो ऑपरेशन इन ऑर्डर टू गेट टू एन अपर ट्राइंगुलर मीट्रिक्स फ्रॉम एन अपर ट्राइंगुलर मीट्रिक्स यूज बैक सब्सटीट्यूशन टू सॉल्व द इक्वेशन okay okay so this particular upper triangular matrix pattern right shown in this slide this is what is called an echelon form what does the word echelon mean in a particular formation okay step like formation the definition is a matrix is said to be in an echelon form if all non zero rows are above any zero rows if any okay that's the first condition second each leading entry so i think i did not uh, although it was written on the slide i did not discuss this all these asterisks right they are called leading entries of that particular row by leading entries i mean the left most non zero entry of each row okay that is what i mean by leading entry for every row then second condition is that each leading entry just repeated the definition over here for convenience left most non zero entry in a row is in a column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it okay, so again if you notice here if i take this particular row row number 3 the leading entry is in the third column right if i look at the row above it So row number two and row number one, you notice that the leading entries are to the left of the leading entry of row number three, or the leading entry of row number three is to the right of the leading entry of row number two and one. Okay, so this is what sort of gives you a step-like pattern. And the third condition is all entries in a column. below the leading entry they have to be all zeros so again look at all these four leading entries here of course i am assuming all these entries are non zero right all entries in the column below the leading entry has to be zero then we say that that particular matrix is in the echelon form think i have examples of echelon form okay so you can notice here that uh, all the leading entries need not be only along the diagonal okay you can see that there is no such condition only condition is so you can see this row is completely a row of zeros that row has to be below any other non zero row Okay, so that's the first condition. Second condition: each leading entry. So all the leading entries I am marking with an asterisk. Okay, that leading entry of the row has to be to the right. Okay, of the leading entry of the row above it. Okay, does not have to be next to it always. You can see over here. This zero is not a leading entry of row two. That is fine, no issues. Okay, and all leading, I mean all entries below the leading entry in that column have to be all zeros. Okay, again here, 
is different. I think I've just repeated the same matrix for some reason, right? Yeah, so maybe you can change this. So something like this. All these dashes, right? What do they indicate? These dashes indicate we don't care what the value are. Whether they are zero or not, I have uh, sort of no problems with that. The leading entries are marked separately. Okay, so these are echelon matrices. This also is a valid echelon matrix. So I have two rows which are zero. That's fine. As far as all both these rows are below any other row which is non-zero. Uh, um, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, here in the augmented matrix uh, for a row, we are also considering the element that is in the augmented column. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, sir, because here uh, I cannot see augmented column. Yes, sir. Ah, so, uh, so this definition, echelon form, applies to any matrix. Whether that matrix is an augmented matrix or not, that's a, it's irrelevant. Uh, and sir, if it were an augmented matrix, then we will consider the element in the column also, and the augmented column also, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, it would also be nice to see examples of non-echelon forms. Okay, so why is this first matrix not in echelon form? Sir, because A0 no. row is above a non-zero. That's the country. How about the second matrix? Can somebody else answer this question? In this, the leading entry should be should be in the right of the row of above. So, which particular leading entry is a problem? Which row? Uh, third. Second. Third row. See, this violates two conditions. One is the leading entry is not to the right of the leading entry of the row above it also this violates the third condition all entries below this leading entry have to be zero in that column but this of course is a leading entry therefore it is not zero okay so because of that this matrix is not in an echelon form how about the third one Third column, the leading entry below that is not zero. In the third column, so you see this? third property is not zero. So let's say if this were to be a zero element. See, when I say dash, it can be anything. So let's say if this is zero, would that convert this into an echelon form? No, no, sir. Here second property is valid. Second property. Right. These two are violating the second property. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yes. So can the asterisk be zero? No. So asterisk is marking a leading entry. What is the definition of leading entry? Leftmost non-zero entry. Okay. Okay, please be clear with this. Leading entry is defined as the leftmost non zero entry. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Sir, similarly, we can have a lower triangular matrix. So, will it also be called uh, echelon form? No, the definition of echelon form is this particular thing and you can see that a lower triangular matrix will not satisfy this. It will satisfy another definition, right? If I change the echelon form to match that lower triangular matrix, then it would change and then it would be an echelon matrix. But as per this definition, it will not be an echelon matrix. Okay. <coughs> see what... Uh, Sarthak, what Sarthak was trying to say is 
if we want to solve this linear system of equations, why only upper triangular? A lower triangular matrix will also serve the same purpose. Is that right, Sarkar? That is what you are trying to see? Yes. Right. Yes, you're absolutely right. Instead of having an upper triangular matrix, you can also get a lower triangular matrix. Okay, and that would also equivalently solve the linear system of equations. Okay, but this is just a convention, right? Uh, there may be softwares that reduce an augmented matrix to a lower triangular rather than an upper triangular. Okay, there is no sort of rule in this case. Okay, so let's continue with this. I hope what is in echelon form is clear to everyone. Let's also look at an extension of this, which is called the row reduced echelon form. Okay, or in short, RREF. <coughs> so a matrix, right? It is in echelon form, first of all. Okay, so it must be in echelon form for it to be in RREF form. Apart from echelon form, it must satisfy these two properties so, so as to be called an RREF. The two conditions is the leading entry in each row has to be 1. How will you get this? Using elementary row operations, is it possible to do this? We can divide a row with uh, some number which is, by, it's leading entry. right and remember once again leading entry by definition is non-zero so dividing by that non-zero term is not an issue okay so it's very easy to satisfy this condition the second condition says that the leading entry is the only non-zero term in that column Okay, so again, if you have an echelon form matrix, let's take this one, right? So how do I get a RREF form using elementary row operations? First, Which divide first and second row by leading terms, and then uh, two uh, all dashes should be zero. Yes, so how will you know? R, once again, would you need all dashes to be zero? No, sir. The okay. last dash in first row right. can, be, this it can be non zero, but we can turn it to zero using robots. Yes, only this term over here has to be zero. Okay. Remember the condition for RREF, the second condition states that all entries in the column of the leading terms have to be zero except the leading term which should be one so here if you look at this column there is no leading term in that column therefore we don't care what is the value here okay <coughs> yes sir so how do we get a zero here Using elementary row operations, multiply so the one it. by upper value and then subtract it. Right. Yeah, I hope that is clear to everyone. Some examples of RREF. Once again, it's the same thing. This entry need not be zero. Okay, because there is no leading term in this column. But in every column where there is a leading term, all entries apart from the leading term have to be zero and all of these have to be one. Instead of an asterisk, I should have ideally written one. And again, I think I made a mistake here. Maybe I wanted to do this and then all of this should be zero. Okay. Any 
Any issues so far? Let's now sort of try to solve that particular linear system of equations. Uh, so I'll just go back so that all of you are able to do this. You can, if you want, you can write this system and try to solve it with me. I've sort of prepared a slide already with the solutions, but uh, you can work it out if you wish. <clears throat> okay, so the idea is, right, I want to solve this system. And I've already discussed the way I will solve this is by using elementary row operations. I will turn this into an upper triangular matrix. Okay. <coughs> so, slide. so this is the same linear system of equations. Okay. So the thing is, I want an upper triangular matrix that sort of has leading terms in roughly this sort of a pattern. Okay, something like this. Now, if I look at this first row carefully, right, my first term itself is zero. Okay, so I don't want to get into this situation. So, what I do is I look for all rows below this or all entries in the first column below this zero and see if there is a non zero entry there. If there is, then I will swap or permute the two equations or in this case permute the two rows. Okay, so I'm doing a permutation of row one and row two. Okay, once I do that, I can say that this is my leading term of row one. Okay. Once that is there, then what do I have to do in order to get an upper triangular matrix or the echelon form of the matrix? I have to ensure that all entries below the leading term have to be zero. And while I'm describing this method for this example, try to observe that this logic can be converted into a computer algorithm. Okay, because the matrix is given to me, of course, given the leading term, I can search whether in that column there are any non-zero entries. Right? Now, if yes. you look at this column, of course, there are these two non-zero entries, two and three. So, I'll have to turn them into zero using elementary row operations. Okay, so what do I do? In order to take care of these two, I can subtract two times row one from row three. Okay, so I'm going to replace row three by row three minus two times row one. And in order to take care of this three in the fourth row, I will replace the fourth row by row four minus three times row one. All right. So once I do that, I will get this kind of a matrix. For now, just believe me. But if you want, you can also finish the computations yourselves. I may be wrong somewhere, but. Uh, I just want to describe the general method. So first column is done, right? All three entries below the leading term one are zeros. And then that gives me the second leading term here. Okay. Then in order to turn this into an echelon form, I have to ensure that these two entries are converted into zeros using elementary row operations. So how do I do that? 
in order to take care of this 3, I can multiply 2 times row 3, from which I can subtract 3 times row 2. Okay, and similarly for row 4, I can replace row 4 by row 4 minus 2 times row 2. Okay, that's going to give me the required zeros below this leading term. That also is going to give me the third leading term here. You can see I did not design the system of equations carefully and I am stuck with such horrible numbers. Now, again, I have to ensure that the terms below this minus 23 have to be all zero. So, I have to perform an awkward computation, of course. So, I will replace row 4 by 23 times row 4 minus 13 times row 3. Okay, so that will give me a zero here. And you can see that. I have the required echelon form with me. Looking at this echelon form, <coughs> what can you conclude as far as solutions to the linear system is concerned? So there are infinite solutions. Right. right? That I it's hope is solution. clear to everyone. Minus 137 times x4 minus 95x5 will be 64. What do we do with this? Find values of x4 and x5. Okay, so let's just try as far as we can. So what is x4 equal to? Or maybe x5. Uh, no, x4. So, right. So, what is x plus 95x5 divided by minus 137? Yes. Then, what do we do with this? Minus 23x3 minus 16x4 plus 2x5 is equal to minus 12. So what is x3? So what do we get? X3 in terms of X5. I, but it will be of this form, right? Some fixed number, let's say P3 plus, let's call it, Q3 into X5. Is that right? Yes, sir. And similarly, X4, I can write it as some P4 plus some Q4 times X5. Okay, then what do we do with this? 2x2, 5x3, plus 4x4, plus 2x5 equals 2. So, what is the solution? x2 would be sum P2 
plus q2 times x5. Yes, I hope everyone is following this. Yes, sir. In this similarly, x1 can also get as p1 plus p1 times x. Right. That will give us something like x1 equal to p1 plus q1 x5. <coughs> so, how does the solution set look like? All variables in terms of x5. Yes. So, sir, it is depend. Uh, all solutions are depend on value of x five. So, how how x five changes, the all solution will changes no, in finite. That is fine. So, if you what I'm trying to say is the solution set right can be written in a proper way. What is that way? That's what I'm asking. So if x5 is 0, what happens? P1, P1, P2, P3, P5, P4, and P5, is there a P5? Zero. No, zero. no, zero. zero. Plus? X5 times. Some, some variable, variable what vector. That's Q1, Q2, Q3. Yeah. One into x five times where or all values of x five, right? Is that right? Yes, sir. So if you look at this, how geometrically what is this looking like? Unfortunately, of course, I cannot draw this. Line. Linear it's combination of two vectors. No, is it linear combination of two vectors? It's not that. It's line. Line, but can you say something about the line? Parallel line. No, no, parallel, no, parallel. Line which is parallel to the vector q1, q2, q3, q4, 1, and uh, having this, uh, having means so and okay. perpendicular because drawn from origin to that line will be p1, p2, p3, p4, 0. So, this is like uh, so in R2, if I have to sort of show you an analogy. These are some fixed numbers, right? P1 to P4 and Q1 to Q4. Yes? yes sir. So this is basically analogous to in R2. Could be maybe, I don't know. Uh, 2, 0 plus 1, 1 times x. Can you plot this set at least? The last coordinate will always x5. So, hey, but point 2, comma 0 is on the line, and line is parallel to, to the vector 1, comma 1. Means it has slope like 1. Like this? Yes, sir. Do everybody agree with this? This point is two comma zero. So that actually it should be minus two comma zero. Yes, sir. Minus two. Why minus two? Sir, because if uh, uh, if we put uh, this equation is equal to zero, then x should come minus. No, 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 no. Why should we put this equation to be zero? I'm saying I want to plot this set, right? So if, what is this set? 
So if x, I mean the only variable here is x, right? So let's say I start with choosing x equal to zero. What point do I get? Zero comma two. Two comma zero, right? So x is zero, so it should be zero comma two. Right? So. No, no. X is this, right? So if x is zero, so this vector becomes zero zero. Uh, okay, okay, sir. Okay. Talking about x axis, coordinate, x coordinate. Okay, okay. I'm talking about this x. So okay, so. Uh, I understand. I understand. So okay. it was again x. Sure. So is this clear? How does the solution set look like? Yes. Sir. So this is exactly how this will also look like. Just in five dimensions. And of course, I cannot draw anything in five dimensions. So it should be a one dimensional land. So, the uh, land will be in dimensional. Yes. In yes. yes. No, what did you say once again? So the solution set will be a line at a one dimensional line in five dimensions. Yes, yes. In principle, yes. Uh, the only thing is I have not yet defined what do we mean by dimension. So just hold on till that. But yes, intuitively you understand that a line is one dimensional. So yes, in that sense, you're right. Okay, now what will determine what is the dimension of the solution? Number of equation and number of uh, variables. Is that the only thing? Sir, I think number of variables minus number of equation will give uh, dimension of solution, but it need not be uh, that dimensional it can be less than that dimensional. Yes. Also. So what determines that? Rank of a matrix. Exactly. So if my u for example is this one zero zero five everything else is zero. So how many variables and how many equations? If my this is my augmented matrix echelon form, right? By the way, I hope you all agree that this is an echelon form. Yes. yes sir. So in this case, what is the equation? What is the solution set? A point. Plane. Is it a point? No, uh, lines. Uh, what line? Is it a line? X equal, to, X equal to 5. five. Five. Mm -hmm. X equal to 5 is a plane. Right. This is X equals 5. What about y values for Y and Z? Y and Z can take any value. Anything. Right. So this is a plane. So what determines it? So number of variables minus rank of matrix. Number of variables minus rank, right? Okay, for example, I could have this example one, one, zero, two, one, zero, zero, zero. Five, two, zero. In this case, what will happen? 
line will be solution set. Right, solution is like a line. Okay. <coughs> is it making sense? Yes. Sorry, here, uh, yes. I ahead. have a doubt here. What is mm -hmm. number of variable minus RAM? That is in some sense going to tell you geometrically how the solution set is going to look like. Is it so in this example over here, uh, you are clear that this is a line? Yes, sir. And similarly, this solution set looks like a line. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Right. So why will it be a line when will it be a line when will it be a point when will it be like a plane when will it be like a three-dimensional or three-dimensional world that is the question okay. okay so if you look at this system how many variables does this have five five what is the rank of this matrix So how many linearly independent rows does this matrix have? Four. Satakai. Okay, you understand. I'm just asking Pujan since he has this doubt. So you able to see that this is a rank four matrix? now see for example uh, can these two rows be linearly dependent row one and row two means we can okay. write in terms of means one in terms of other how oh. How by multiplying this row, by what number will you get a non-zero entry in this? No, actually no number. No number. So therefore, these two have to be linearly independent. Independent, right? yes. Similarly, these two? Oh, linearly independent. Yes. All three? Yes, yeah, they are linearly independent. All four? Okay, independent. So rank four. So rank is four. Mm -hmm. Okay, so number of variables is five. Rank is four. So your solution set, if it exists, of course, right? That also is important. If it exists, then it will look like a line, which is sort of a one-dimensional entity. In this example over here. What is the rank? This is easy to see, right? Rank of this matrix is? Two. Which is the other? So this is linearly independent, right? The first row. Yes. Which other row is linearly independent? <coughs> Only first row is. So therefore, what is the rank? One. One. Right? One. One. And how many variables does this have? Three. Three. So three minus one. Two. Two. So plane, right? It has two directions, right? In which you can move and okay. still stay on the plane. So that is why this is two. Okay, okay. okay I, got I got it, sir. Okay. Anybody else has doubts here? continue right now we have done these elementary row operations we have just written it intuitively right yes yes sir now each of these elementary row operations can themselves be 
performed on the matrix by multiplying two matrices. Okay, so if I want to exchange row one and row two of this matrix in order to get this matrix, can I multiply a matrix to this matrix so as to get this matrix? If I call this matrix A and if I call this matrix A1, right? Is there some matrix, let's call it P, such that P into A is equal to A1? Remember A is a 4 cross 6 matrix, A1 is a 4 cross 6 matrix. <coughs> what should be the size of the matrix P? 4 cross 4. 4 cross 4. Can you find that matrix P? Oh, yes, sir. Sir, it will, sir, it will be 0, 1, then all zeros. Then one zero, then all zeros, then zero zero one and zero 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 one. Good. Right. You can see this is just again. Remember in the tutorial, I think I had mentioned that when you are multiplying a matrix to the left of some matrix, you are just doing a linear combination of the rows. And all yeah. these elementary row operations are doing nothing but just linear combination of rows. Okay, so take it that way. You can see that this permutation of first two rows and this representing it as P subscript 1, 2, permute P for permutation and rows 1 and 2 are permuted. So that's why P1, 2 is this matrix. Similarly, in the next step, remember I'm doing something like this replacing row 3 by 2 times row 3 minus 3 times row 2, right? So that also I can write it in this matrix form. I am replacing the third row. So I should only change the third row. All other rows do not change, which is why apart from the third row, everything is like an identity matrix. Then in row 3, what I am doing? I am multiplying minus 3 to row 2. This entry corresponds to row 2. And I want to multiply it to minus 3. Add it to 2 times row 3. That is how I have written this matrix. And uh, do you see why I am labeling it L? In third row, we are adding some multiple of second row. That's why. That's, That's three. why 3, 2. The subscript 3, 2 makes sense. That is why. But why L? This linear combination. No. Good try, but no, there's more to it. Okay, let me give you a clue. This matrix, I'm representing it as. U, Y. Because it is upper triangular. What about this matrix? Lower triangle. Lower triangle. Is lower triangular. Okay, I think uh, yeah, I'm out of time. Let me stop here. We'll continue with this uh, in the next class, which is on Tuesday, right? Right. So I would try. I would suggest that try to make your own systems of equations. Maybe three variables, four equations, four equations, three variables, three equations, three variables, and try to work out the solutions. Try to visualize the solutions. That is more important. Okay, when will it be like a line, etc. Try to correlate it with the rank and so on and so forth. Okay, so we'll stop here for today. Sir. Uh, yes. Sir, here we uh, replaced, uh, means interchange row 1 and row 2. Here yes. 